We're starting a brand new series today called Asking for a Friend. You know, everyone uh, has probably had those feelings before where it's like you had a question to ask, there was something you were interested in, but it's like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to let someone in on that, that I'm questioning that, you know? And um, man, especially when it comes to God, I think most people have more questions than they have answers. And I want to take the next few weeks and just open up this idea of like, hey, what are your questions? And, and I want to invite you to email us at hello at coastalchapel.com. Any question you may have, and we're going to do our very best somehow to give you an educated biblical answer on it. But today I want to talk about a simple question, but at the same time, it's a very profound question. It's very important and probably one of the most paramount questions that anyone could ever ask. And that is, how do I give my life to God? How do I give my life to God? You know, I grew up in South Carolina and in a Pentecostal home. And it, to me, it's just for someone not to understand, you know, what it means to give their life to God is really a foreign idea. You know, it's like people down here not understanding what grits are. You know, for all you southern folks, you know what I'm talking about or how it's a third degree felony uh, to drink tea unsweetened. But it's just a, it's an odd thing. But the truth is, is that people don't know. People don't know. People are asking questions. How do I give my life to God? I'll never forget. I was playing golf with a couple of guys years ago. And uh, <clears throat> we began to talk about things of faith. And these were guys that I, I weren't really close with. I, uh, it was at the beginning of a relationship, you know. And uh, one of the guys was a friend with the, with the, the guy that I was really connected with. And he had flown down from New York. And I remember we began to talk about things of faith. And on the ninth hole, he asked me, he says, hey, Rev, uh, can, we, can we take confession now? And I said, man, you don't have to confess anything to me. And I began to tell him about, you know, how no man stands in between us and God. But just putting our faith in God is simply talking to him. He's right there for us. And man, for him, it was just revolutionary. It was revolutionary. He didn't know how to give his life to God. And I want to just kind of share a little bit of thoughts on that today. I want to talk about a story out of uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas find themselves in a prison. And they found themselves in a prison for actually, uh, well, they had cast a, a demon out of a girl. But, but it was what they were doing during this time was they were preaching about salvation. So they're qualified to answer this question about salvation. And so Acts chapter 16, verse 25, says this. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Isn't that cool? This is a midnight miracle. They were singing hymns to God uh, and, and, and in prison, and the prisoners were listening to them. So everyone was listening in to what they were saying. And, and suddenly there was a great earthquake and so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfettered. Man, this is, this is the first jailhouse rock. Come on, somebody. A one, a two. I'm just kidding. I couldn't do any, a good Elvis impression if I tried, but uh, thank you very much. But, but I know that this is the first jailhouse rock ever. They're in a prison. It's midnight. They're singing. All of a sudden, the thing starts shaking. You know, chains come off. Wow. The Bible goes on in verse 27, it says that when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that everyone had escaped. I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, pr pressure on the job. I mean, this guy was carrying uh, some immense pressure, you know, to, to get his job right. Uh, but Paul cried with a loud voice. He says, hey, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Don't, don't put that sword down. Everybody's here, bud. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. You know, I, I think about that. You know, when I think about him falling down, uh, I think about how he sensed the presence of God. I mean, this was a God moment for this jailer. And then he brought them out and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, people have been asking this question for thousands of years. How do I give my life to God? What must I do to be saved? You know, this was a moment of absolute clarity for this jailer. 
you know, I think about he was a Philippian jailer. And, and oftentimes in the first century, he could have been a slave uh, that was, was paid for this position, who had this responsibility. But, you know, the scripture goes on to talk about how he has a family and, and he has a house. And he's probably a guy just like me or you. Uh, but in this moment, when I think about this moment in this jail, this was just a moment of extreme clarity for this guy. I mean, it, the scripture says that he came in, he fell, he was trembling, he fell on his knees. And at this moment of clarity, uh, man, I'm a sinner. Uh, I need God. This moment of, of, of conviction, like, man, there's something in between me and God. There's, there's something I've got to take care of. I'm not right with God. And, and, and in that moment, I mean, he just felt sweet conviction. And I think about that in our lives. You know, I don't know if you've ever had moments like that, but I've experienced moments of absolute conviction. You know, I remember when Aaron and I, and I, I talk about this so much because it's just our story, but when we went through our dark night of the soul, I remember in the very beginning, you know, I was sorry. Uh, and, and of course, you know, when you, when you wrong someone, you're sorry. But, but it seemed like just weeks after that, it was like it finally hit me, you know. And it was like this, this true, immense repentance came over me. Like this godly sorrow. Like, man, what have I done? What have I done? And, uh, and it was a moment of clarity for me. I, I've had several moments of clarity like that over my life. When I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 18 years old, I was wearing a, a, a Gantt long sleeve polo. Timberland boots. I had long hair. I was a thug wannabe. And man, when I came to God, it was in that moment of clarity that I knew that I needed Christ. I needed saving. It was a moment of clarity. You know, during this season of what we're going through, you know, I just can only imagine that many people are having moments of clarity. That the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. That He's showing them things. And, and you know, we're, we're in our homes and there's so much pressure attached to that. You know, there's, there's, we don't have all the outlets that we've had before. We can't just go to the movies. How many of you guys are like me? And when you get stressed out or you feel like you're about to burn out, I just go to the movies. I can't tell you how many times I've been by myself and seen two movies back to back. A big tub of popcorn and a big Diet Coke. I mean, that is just relaxation at its finest. Come on, y'all. But you can't do that now. You can't go out to the movies now. You can't go to a baseball game. You can't go to the mall. How are we blowing off steam? I mean, we're just trapped in our homes. And I think that for many of us, the pressure of that is probably bringing some moments of clarity. And in that moment, this man, he fell on his knees. You know, Jesus said that in John 14, 6, he said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one came to the Father except through Him. You know, I want to tell you today, if you're asking how do you give your life to God, the first thing you got to know is that Jesus is the only way to God. He said it Himself. He said, man, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to God except through Jesus. In John 6, Jesus said that no one comes to me unless the Father draws Him. You know, I'm talking about how do you give your life to God today. You know, I want to tell you that those moments of clarity are only by the Holy Spirit. They're only by God. It's only the Spirit that draws us. You know, man, if, if God is convicting you, if God is drawing you, if God is speaking to you about your life, don't just shove it off as like, oh, that's just what I'm feeling. That's just me. I'm feeling too much. No, you need to recognize this is a holy moment of clarity where God is drawing you in. He's drawing you because He's the only way to the Father. And if you're being drawn to the Father, it's through Jesus. And it's a gift of clarity that God gives you. It takes a work of the Holy Spirit to show us our sinfulness and to show us that we need a Savior. You know, Paul said, and I grew up with this my whole life. And I think it's, it just brings such clarity to the story of salvation. It's called the Romans Road. And the the first stop in the Romans road is a passage of scripture, Romans 3.23. And it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, I'm going to tell you, there's not one person that's watching this today or tomorrow or next Friday or a year from now that hasn't sinned and fallen short of God's glory. 
There's no person on, on this planet that's perfect and without sin. You know, all of us miss the mark. And that's really what it means. It means miss the mark. You know, if you've been married for any amount of time and you've got a good wife, husband, you know that you've missed the mark. Come on. Give me an amen right there where you're at. Missing the mark. We've fallen short of God's glory. We just can't attain the holiness of God on our own. And so recognizing that sinfulness, that's the first step in giving our life to God. If you want to give your heart to God, it's got to be with an attitude of repentance. Saying, Lord, this sin that I'm carrying, I don't want to carry it anymore. Well, the second stop on the Romans road is, 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 a, is a crucial one. It's Romans 6.23. And it says that the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know, I want you to think about that for a second. You know, when you go to work, and you, 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 uh, you, put, you know, punch the time card, and you put a few hours in. Uh, let's say you put 40 in or 50 in for the week, and then you get a wage back, right? You get, there's, there's an exchange for your labor. You get a wage back. Here's the thing about sin, is that sin, its payment is death. If you want to know if there's sin in your life, just look for the death that's around you. You know, Louis Pasteur in the 1800s, when he discovered uh, the germ theory of disease, everyone thought he was crazy. Everyone's like, man, what are you talking about? These little things that you can't see, these germs, they're killing us. Are you kidding me? Everyone thought, well, man, only bullets kill people. But he saw something no one else saw. You know, I want to ask you now, if, if you're infected with the coronavirus, how do you know you're infected? Because of the symptoms, right? Well, you got fever and chills and you're cough. Oh, I might have coronavirus. Well, if you want to know there's sin in your life that needs to be dealt with, look for the places of death. Dead relationships. Those feelings of remorse and guilt that you're wrestling with. Those things, those places of hurt. The sin that's in our lives, those, there's a wage of death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I'm preaching the gospel to you today, man. I'm preaching, I'm preaching the good news that, you know what? It's sin, sin gives us a wage of death, but the gift of God, the free gift, one you can't earn, you can't work for, you can't punch your time card to get it. It's just a gift of God. It's eternal life. So Romans 3, 23, man, hey, uh, We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But hit, this one's my favorite. Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love for us. Wow, man. Isn't that cool? I'm going to tell you, Aaron loves when I demonstrate my love for her. When I bring her some flowers or when I give her a nice embrace, or come on, somebody, when I start vacuuming that floor, I start washing those dishes, I start taking the kids. When I say, hey, babe, I'm going to take the kids for a little bit. Once you get some, <laughs> when I start demonstrating my love, she perks up. Well, you know, God demonstrated his love for you. And he did it in the most lavish, intense way ever. Come on. He sent his son. God demonstrated his, his love for us. That while we were still sinners, he gave his only son for us. Isn't that cool? God gave us his son. He gave us the best he had. He gave us the best he had in Jesus. So you know what? You might be feeling, you might be having moments of clarity through this season. You might be saying, man, I'm falling short in a lot of ways. I'm falling short in a lot of ways. But I want to tell you something. Even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life. And you have a Father who loves you. You have a Heavenly Father that cares about you. The Scripture says that every hair on your head has been numbered. That's right, ladies, even the gray ones that you're trying to pull out. God has them numbered. He loves you that much. As far the Scripture says this, it says this, as, as the... As many as the sand on the sea, right? All those grains of sand. That's how his thoughts. Wow, the Lord loves us so much. 
And he gave us his son, Jesus, to die as a sacrifice to make payment for our sins. Romans 5 8, such a good one, right? And then here's the last one is Romans 10 9. And this is, this is where it gets a little technical, okay? Now remember, we're talking today about how do I give my life to God? You know, if you're watching this and you're, you're asking this question, I want to tell you, this is, the, this is the, the technical part. Catch this. It says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? If you be- confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart that God raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, come on, you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth, what does that mean? Well, that basically means that, that you have to say with your vocal cords and your uh, lips, you have to say that Christ is Lord, that you believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus came as God. He walked on this earth. He gave his life for us as a payment for sin by death on a cross. He was raised from the dead. Come on. Died and raised from the dead. And now he lives right in heaven at the right hand of God forever to make intercession for us, forever praying for us and loving us and reaching out to us. Isn't that cool? If you can believe that by faith and confess it with your mouth, believe it in your heart, you will be saved. Now, you know, the story of that jailer, it it doesn't stop there. Um, you know, he, he comes in, he's trembling. He's got this moment of clarity. And he says, guys, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas, again, they're experts on this. In verse 31, it says this, that they looked at that jailer and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your house. I want to tell you something today is that God wants to bring salvation to your whole family, your whole house. That story goes on to talk about how the jailer actually brought them into his home and his whole family was saved. Listen to me, dads. I want to tell you, there's never been a better time for you to make a commitment to God. Listen to me, moms. There's never been a better time for you to recommit or to commit your life to Christ Jesus. Your whole family needs you to be saved. They need you to know God. This is a perfect time. We may be going through a crazy season in America, in the world. We may be trapped in our homes. But you know what? We can live with such a freedom. A freedom from sin. A freedom from guilt. A freedom from shame. A freedom from the penalty of sin. A freedom from a a future destined for destruction. We can be free from those things if we place our faith in Jesus Christ. So you say, well, man, Pastor Ron, I'm asking for a friend. How do I give my life to God? Well, it's simple. When God gives you that moment of clarity, when you know that you've sinned and you need to repent, take that moment to receive his love as a father. Take that moment to, with your mouth, to confess Christ. Christ, you're my Lord. Believe it in your heart and you will be saved. I want to pray with you now. You know, this is a prayer that you can pray while you're there. And I want to ask every person, you know, many of you here uh, watching this morning, you may have already committed your life to Christ. But I want you to say this prayer with me just as a reminder of that moment in time when you gave your life to God. Let's pray this prayer. Now again, it's not the prayer, it's the faith that counts. It's the believing that counts, not the words. But this is just a way to help you center in and know in this moment that God's listening. Would you say this with me? Say, Father, today I'm giving you my life. I ask you in Jesus' name to forgive me of all of my sin, to wash me clean, to give me a brand new, fresh start, to empower me with your Holy Spirit to save my whole family. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Man, if you prayed that prayer today, listen, you have been saved. You've given your life to God. Now it's time to walk out that salvation. And we want to help you do that. I want to invite you to go to coastalchapel.com forward slash new life and let us know if you made a commitment today. We'll reach out to you, man. We'll be there for you. We'll try to, to get you some resources to come around you and, and, to, and to see you foster this new relationship. And so, you know what? Hey, I'm excited to, to see, and, and I wish, man, I just want to welcome new family members into the kingdom of God. We'll never know how many people have watched this and how many people have prayed that prayer, but I believe that God, every prayer that was prayed, God's responding. Well, listen, I want to thank you again for joining us. And right now, we're going to end the, the, the stream, but we're going to go, we're going to move the party over to the after party. And uh, in the comments, there's going to be a link for a Zoom uh, conference call. And man, you're welcome to jump on and just be a part of this after party and connect. We want to see your face. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear what's going on. God bless you guys. Hope you were blessed and inspired. Have a great week. See you at the after party.